This is Derek Bros with the Conscious Resistance Network. Today is Saturday, September 12th. I'm here in New York City talking with author and all around intelligent, beautiful person, John Perkins. How are you doing? Good, Derek. Great to meet you. Great to be here with you. So I just heard you speak. We're here at the 9 11 Symposium, and we're hearing a range of theories and ideas about who is behind the 9 11 attacks or what the results are and efforts to declassify the 28 pages. Uh, I'd like you to briefly, for the audience at home, recap what your talk was related to 9-11 and your, and your thoughts on the 9-11 attacks. Well, as I said in the talk, I have no idea who was behind 9-11, but I do know that whoever was behind 9-11, they succeeded in accomplishing what we were all told Osama bin Laden wanted to accomplish. They basically destroyed any semblance of democracy in the United States. We, they've created a, a, a police state here. Uh, an economy that makes the rich constantly richer and the poor poorer and the middle class is pretty much disappearing in a way. The gap between rich and poor has has widened. Um, out of every one billion dollars of, of money, of wealth that's created in the United States today, we, you and I, the average citizen, gets one dollar out of every billion. And one percent of the population gets most of it. I mean, things have just happened incredibly since 9-11. Many, many more e economic hitmen in many different guises, lobbyists, uh, lawyers, uh, pr promoters, executives, all kinds of people, many, many more kinds of jackals. Now they're flying drones and, and you know, uh, over us, over our cities, as well as, as well as in other places. And perhaps these, most of these uh, drones have the ability to assassinate people. They are assassinating people in the Middle East. Uh, it's an estimate that our drones have brought down about 6,000 innocent civilians. That's an estimate that's done by military veterans who've pleaded with drone operators not to do it anymore. But the fact is it's being done. And now those drones are flying over us, too. Uh, so, you know, since 9-11, everything has changed. It's just gotten worse. The good news is that a lot of people are also waking up all around the world, including in the United States. There's a consciousness revolution. We're understanding that this system is not working. 5% of us live in the United States. We consume roughly 30% of the world's resources, while half the world is starving or on the verge of starvation. That's not a model. China can't do it with 19% of the world's population. They can't do it. Brazil can't do it. India can't do it. They're trying to recreate the model, but the fact is it's not a model. It's a failed system created a death economy based on militarization and ravaging the earth. And now we need to realize we've got to create a new kind of an economy, a life economy based on cleaning up pollution, helping starving people feed themselves, creating new technologies for transportation and communications and banking and everything else that, that doesn't tear up the earth, that recognizes the resources are all here. You know, we just got to use the ones that are already out there, essentially recycling. So everything's changed. Absolutely. And you mentioned just a moment ago your book, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Economic Hitman, and that's the title of your book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, from 2004. Um, I wanted to, you know, like you said, everything's changed since 9-11. What has been your experience, though, since you wrote the book, and since that time, do you, has this gotten any better, worse? You know, has the amount of Economic Hitman grown around the world? Well, yes, absolutely, hugely. You know, in, in my day, there were just... Uh, a handful of us, really, and we were kind of generic. Uh, our job was to identify countries with, corporation, with, with resources our corporations covet, like oil, arrange huge loans to those countries from the World Bank or its sister organizations, but the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in those countries, power plants and highways, things that in addition to serving our corporations that built them, who were the main beneficiaries, it would also help a few wealthy families, but the majority of the people didn't benefit at all. They were too poor to buy electricity or use the highways, and yet they were left with a huge debt that they couldn't repay. And so at some point we go in and say, hey, you know, you can't pay your debts, give us your, your resources cheap, uh, privatize your utilities, your schools, your jails, sell them to our corporations. And there were a few of us, and we didn't really care who they sold those things to. But today, 
this, those people are still there, but every major corporation also has its own version of economic hitmen. Monsanto does, Nike does, Kmart does, Walmart does, I mean, everybody, all these big corporations, all the oil companies, they're out there just promoting their own products, goods and services. So it's gotten vast. You know, the world's changed tremendously uh, since I was an economic hitman. And since the book came out, which was in 2004, and I, I, I was stimulated to write it by visiting the Ground Zero after 9-11. So basically, the, kind of the, the, the book, the period between when that book came out, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and now, and I'm writing another book, which is the follow-up to that book coming out in February of 2016, I've gone back and really looked at, so it, was, it almost coincide. 9-11 with the writing of that book. And so these, these same changes, it's, it's just been, it's, it's been coinciding. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things I wanted to ask as well about the book is um, I was doing my research on it, and when it was released, shortly afterwards, you had some critics come out and say that the stories that you tell in there were, you know, fabrications or based on lies, and the, the U.S. government said that, you know, they've never had anything to do with you, that they don't, like the process that you described, the recruitment through the NSA, that, you know, that doesn't happen. Now, is that what we should expect, you know, them to disavow any knowledge of, of your work? Or, you know, wh what is, what is the, the repercussions of you coming out and speaking? Well, yeah, uh, you know, the, the State Department published a misinformation website, <laughs> um, which sold a lot of books for me, incidentally. <laughs> and, and I since have learned from people overseas that, one of the reasons that that was done was because ambassador, U.S. ambassadors and other diplomats from the United States were constantly being asked by people overseas, so what's the official position on this book? What, what do you think about this book? You know, what's, mm -hmm. Is it true? And, the, and ambassadors and people didn't know what to say, so the State Department kind of was left with no choice but to publish an official statement, the website that these diplomats could mm -hmm. turn people to. And, and it was kind of funny because it, it, the whole premise was based on the idea that I say that I was recruited by the NSA, National Security Agency, which I was, and, and that's the, the, the records to prove that. And, and, and they didn't contest that. They said, but the National Security Agency, uh, it, 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 the, this couldn't be true because the National Security Agency, and then they quoted its mission statement, which basically says all they do is cryptography, encoding and decoding messages. And of course, we all know the National Security Agency does a lot more than that. And now it's become very clear. Bechtel Corporation uh, tried to sue me. The Summer Institute of Linguistics, this missionary group tried to sue me. So people came at me. But I had very good files, backup files. And I sent them copies, and all the lawsuits went away. They just, they just dropped them. The New York Times did a major article on the book. Uh, and they, they, they vetted it very, very strongly. They went back and looked at my college records. At, and, you know, they concluded that it was true, and as you know, much as they could determine. So uh, I, I think all of that's way behind me. And I don't even get asked those questions anymore. I, th I think that's, you know, people know that that's all true. And, of course, I've got... State propaganda. Yeah, state propaganda. I've got passports to prove I was in all those countries at the time. They, uh, you know, it's obvious that the, the, the company I worked for, Charles D. Main, uh, the, my resume of chief economist there. So, you know, they tried, but it didn't work too well. In fact, I think it, I'd say it backfired because it sold lots of books, which is the last thing they wanted to have happen. And like you said, when the government comes out to release disinfo about you, that usually gets people to, like, to look at what you're saying. Let me, let me see what this guy's talking about if the government wants to discredit him. Exactly. And, and fortunately, there were a lot of things in the book I didn't say that I wanted to say, but I didn't have backup information. And I'm really grateful that I only exposed things that I could prove, that I had, I had deep, I kept a lot of files. And so that was very important, because if I couldn't have proved some of those things, the, 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 it might have come back to haunt me, even though it was still true. Uh, you gotta have the evidence, you gotta be able to stand up in court if you, if you need to do that. Mm -hmm. I wanna shift gears for a moment to talk a bit about the, the other side of your work that you were involved with and still are involved with before the book, which is, you know, promotion of indigenous cultures and belief systems and shamanism and these type of ideas, which are definitely, uh, you know, close to my heart and to my particular message. So if you could just let us know a bit about how did you get involved with, uh, with that work? You know, how did you first come to be involved in Amazon and ayahuasca and things like that? Well, when I got out of business school in 1968, I joined the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps sent me into the Amazon. And 
at one point I got very, very sick. Uh, I was dying, and, and I was deep, deep in the Amazon. Two-day walk from the nearest road, another two days to the nearest doctor and rickety old buses. Uh, I couldn't get out. I was dying, and a shaman saved my life. It, it shapeshifted my, you know, me in one night, and uh, that changed my life. Just feeling that and seeing that, and he, he day or two after that, I, I was fully recovered. Uh, had this amazing experience that night. That it, where what I saw was that. Um, I'd been brought up in a very old traditional New England family of eating very, uh, very uninteresting foods, if you will, no spices, you know, meat and potatoes basically, and practice, you know, you gotta wash your hands a lot, strong hygiene. Suddenly I'm living with people that don't, have never seen a bar of soap, and they eat things like squirming white grubs that you take right out of a tree, and they drink a kind of beer called chicha because you don't drink the water from the rivers because there's a lot of organic material in the rivers. They know that. So they drink just chicha, which is made by women chewing and spitting manioc root, yucca. And so I'm drinking spit beer, a lot of it, because there's nothing, there's, I can't drink the water. I'm eating a lot of these strange foods because there weren't any cliff bars. <laughs> and, and, and I'm getting very sick. And I saw on that journey, that shamanic journey that night, that you know, every time I ate these foods or drank this drink, I heard a voice saying, it'll kill you. Probably my mom or dad or somebody, you know, this mindset that I had that it would kill me. And I also saw on that journey how incredibly healthy the Schwa people who I was hanging out with were. The men are built like Rambo. They carry heavy dead animals that they've killed. They're, they're hunters, you know, they, and very strong. And the women, well, I was in my early 20s, the women were looking very good to me, you know. <laughs> and so on this one night, on this shamanic journey, I saw that it wasn't the food or drink that was killing me because they were very healthy people. They were eating and drinking the same stuff. It was a mindset. And that changed my life, you know. And, and after realizing that, the next day I was perfectly healthy, the shaman came up to me a couple of days later and said, I owed him. And he told me that, my pain, that what I had to do to pay him was become his apprentice. And at that point, I had no interest in being, I mean, I'd never even heard of a shaman before. It wasn't popular in those days like it is today. I was a business major. I, the last thing I wanted was to be a shaman. I mean, what's, what's the profit in that, you know? But he saved my life. So I agreed, and it launched me on a whole new course, you know? Uh, and, and I've been on that course ever since. And teach it now, write books about it, continue to go back all the time. I fell in love with those people. I fell in love with the jungle. I never get sick again. I, I stayed in the Peace Corps for three years. It's a two-year course. I extended for a year. I would have extended for more, but they wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. And I bet I go back all the time. I was just in the, with these same people in the Amazon about a month ago. Um, and it's a huge part of my life, and I've also come to understand that that teaching is what we need right now because it's all about consciousness. I mentioned the mindset. In a way, where we are today is this mindset. You know, when we, 9-11 is a mindset. Whatever you choose to believe, it's, it's this mindset. And the government wants to implant it in us a certain mindset. And our whole idea of the materialistic culture and this death economy we've created that's based on militarism and ravaging the earth is all a mindset and we need to change that mindset and shamanism teaches us that we can do it pretty quickly we just have to really focus on it and, and redirect the energies the way we the way we expend our energies Absolutely. you talk a, a lot about the the revolution of consciousness that's happening now this really is a conscious revolution that's happening evolution that's happening around the world and i i agree 100 percent um, if you could just leave us with some words of encouragement, thoughts on that particular aspect of what we're dealing with and how individuals out there who are listening and you know, on their own pursuit of truth and justice and freedom, how they can, they can work towards this uh, evolution. Yeah, I, I think this is the most amazing time ever to be alive. I think your generation is extremely fortunate, and you may, a lot of you may not realize that it looks pretty tough, but I think we're, we're blessed to be at this time of... of, of we're being forced to change. And we're being forced to wake up if we're gonna survive as a species, and I believe we will. But what I would say you know, to, to your audience is uh, the most important thing is to follow your passion. 
You know, go where your heart takes you. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to be successful. It doesn't matter how much money you make or what title you have. If you don't follow your heart, you won't be successful. And, you know, it doesn't... I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a writer. That's what I like to do. That's where my passion is. So that's where I devote my energies. You're, you're doing this. This is amazing. But if you're a carpenter, if you like that, follow that passion. You know, if you're a teacher, follow that passion. If you like children and, 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 and you want to spend, be a mother or, or, you know, a babysitter or what, whatever, follow that passion. But if every one of us follows our passion, but we direct our energies toward creating an environmentally sustainable, socially just, spiritually fulfilling world, which is what we must create if we're going to survive as a species, if we all direct our passions toward that end, we'll get there. We can take many different routes. You know, the root of the carpenter, the root, the root of, the, of, of the parent, uh, the root of, 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 the, of the writer. It doesn't matter. Follow your passion, but direct it toward creating a world that, that, our, our, that future generations will thank us for. And not just future generations of human beings. We've got to get, receive the thanks of the trees. All nations. The, the trees, yeah, the plants, the animals, the rivers, the rocks, the mountains all of it, all sentient beings, mm -hmm. to recognize that we're living on a living Earth. And it's, it's kind of a space station, a living space station, um, but unlike the space station that our astronauts built, this one doesn't have any shuttles. You can't get off. I can't get off. Maybe one or two people will go to the moon or Mars or someplace, but most of us won't get off, and we don't want to get off. So we got to take care of her. We got to take care of this living earth, and that's where you know, shamanism is really, really uh, helps us understand how to do that and the importance of doing it and changing the mindset. Changing, as I'd say, change the dream, change the paradigm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time and your work. My pleasure. Thank you for all you're doing, Derek. Keep, keep it up. This is so important. Keep it up. Keep speaking to your generation. Keep speaking truth. <laughs>